I have said before that there are two main types of dovetailers. There are those ruffians that say that, hey, a dovetail is just a utilitarian joint. For the most part, they are never going to be seen by your customers, so you might as well just uh, get them done as fast as possible. Small gaps and errors don't really matter as long as they will hold their own weight and will serve for generations. And you know something? Those guys are somewhat right if we were living 200 years ago. Because as a utilitarian joint, people were making them simply because nails and screws were really expensive. But nowadays, we have a lot less inexpensive ways that won't take too much time to do that, you can use, that will serve just as good a purpose as a utilitarian dovetail joint. You know that joint in the back of drawers everyone's talking about when they do them really, really fast? Well, if you've got the back of a drawer, if you're butting it up to something, there's no reason you couldn't put a pocket hole or a nail or a screw in there because once again they're in the back they won't be seen that much and that's the attitude that they take with those utilitarian dovetails today we're going to talk about the other type of dovetailers those people that are actually looking for a little bit more precision that doing a really precise joint and it any kind of joint, dovetail, Morrison tendon, or anything like that, something that actually might be seen, it really doesn't take that much more time than doing something just rude and crude. The key difference is you're going to spend a little bit more effort on the design of the joint, you're going to spend a little bit more time on its layout, and you're going to focus a lot more on sawing to the line. Now I want to talk about that first. I am going to give you a very condescending tip that will radically improve your sawing ability, your sawing accuracy, your skill at either taking the line, leading the line, or splitting the line. You ready? Okay, so you have the line right there. Let's just pretend my marker is a saw. Here we go. If you're sawing something and you get off your mark, stop sawing. It's really that simple. But time and time again, I'll see people beginning dovetailing that walk in the line. I guess they're just focusing so much on the sawing technique that they're actually not really watching the line. But they'll come over to me. They're already down at their baseline, and it was way off to begin with. And, you know, you don't want to say it out loud, but why did you keep sawing? <laughs> see, a saw curve. I, well, there is a reason why saws have set on a saw. You know, you have your plate, and the teeth kind of go to the side to side like that. And that creates a saw kerf that the saw plate can fall down into. Well, because of that kerf, your saw can actually steer a little bit as you are starting. So you start the saw out right on the line. If you're getting off of it, you can actually steer it a little bit at the beginning. Now, the farther down into the cut you get, there are other techniques that you can use to get back onto the line. Basically, coming back up, resetting your angle, sawing down. But the farther down you get, generally, if you started on the line and you progress, you know, maybe a quarter of the way through the cut, well, then you're going to be on the line. It's just that initial little bit where people get off, but they keep sawing. So if you're off the line, stop. The other thing that's going to really help you get precise saws, or at least not be a stumbling block towards you becoming a good sawer, is uh, getting a well-sharpened saw. It doesn't have to be a big fancy saw. I mean, even a little $8 one you buy at the local hardware store, as long as it is well-sharpened, it will track straight. There's nothing more frustrating, especially for a new woodworker, to start sawing, and maybe because the teeth are set more to one side than the other, it kind of wanders a little bit, and you're constantly having to stop and reset. A well-done saw will just want to go straight. It won't want to wander at all. Now, my personal preference has always been this kind of gent saw, and I'm going to tell you I'm a bit of an odd duck. It's simply because I taught so many kids a few years back 
that for a kid with their smaller hands and their dexterity and the size things, they always seem to do better with a gent saw. Something about it, I don't know. A lot of them would struggle a little bit more with a traditional pistol grip saw. But if you're getting into the hobby, I really do want to steer you more towards the pistol grips. Because there's nothing about a gent saw other than a little weight down below that will help you align it straight. I mean, they are generally completely round. I know some people will put a little flat right there just as an indicator, but it's not much. Whereas a pistol grip, when you pick it up and you're holding it lightly in your hand, there's this huge registry that tells you the angle the saw will cut. And with a little bit of time, I'm talking just maybe a few weekends, it will become so natural for you to pick up a saw, look at a line, and then just align it right on there. I mean, it is a very intuitive skill that develops rapidly when people get into hand tool woodworking. And that skill will transfer to all your other types of joinery and hand tool work. So get a well-sharpened, preferably pistol grip style saw. Now, besides a saw, you're probably going to want a few other tools. Obviously, a chisel. And you're probably going to want a couple different sizes of chisels depending upon the design of your joinery. You're going to want a marking knife. And it, you want it sharp, but not too sharp. I generally only sharpen mine up to about a thousand grit. I find it gives me a better line that way, and it doesn't want to follow the grain as much. If you are going to use a pencil, Plan on sharpening it a whole bunch, and another little trick is rotate it after each stroke, just a little bit. That's kind of like I, why I like the round ones versus the octagon ones. Then you're going to want more than one marking gauge, because you're going to have a bunch of different settings that you want to transfer between things, especially if the wood you're using is of different thicknesses. You're also going to want some kind of way of laying out. I know a lot of people use a ruler, but I kind of find more accuracy with the dividers. And I'm going to be using two in this setup. Other than that, you want some way to get your angles consistent. And I use just a little homemade dovetail gauge, but any kind of gauge will help you in that alignment. You want a plane to help you smooth it out. And then these two tools right here, these are somewhat interchangeable and in this application they're going to, they would serve the same function. And that's cutting a shoulder ever so slightly down. You can use either one, there you go. If I were to buying, if I was just getting into this hobby, I would definitely get the router over the shoulder plane. Now the first thing you're going to want to decide is whether you're going to do, do tails or pins first. And both of them have their advantages and disadvantages in relation to how precise you're going to be able to cut the joints. Now, I'm going to admit, 90% of the times I'm going to go tails first just out of force of habit, despite sometimes pins would be more advantageous. And they're advantageous because if you're doing a big tall cabinet, sometimes it's just easier to be able to lay the wood down and balance it up to transfer the lines, get everything set up. Whereas if you're doing tails first, many times you're balancing in your vise, and if it's too long for your vise, well then you're up high, it's just very, very cumbersome. And doing pins first is a very German way to do it, and if you want more information on pins first dovetails, definitely look up Frank Klaus, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, he has several videos out online, really awesome, just don't blink, he does them really, really fast. But for if you're doing tails first, the, some of the advantages is you can gang cut them. Meaning I can cut both of these two sides of a cabinet at the same time. And for precision, the advantages are if you're cutting a longer distance, it's easier to follow the straight line. Also, you're pretty much guaranteed that both sides will be identical. So if it's like on a blanket chest where it's laying on its side or you're going to see the gaps, it'll be a lot more close. Though, I will tell you this, when they're far enough apart, nobody can really tell if it's a millimeter off here or there. But, it does make cutting those longer straight lines easier. The second thing you need to make sure of is that your boards are completely prepped. They are whatever dimensions you want them to be. Now, these right here are all 
four square, meaning 90 and completely four degrees. And that's probably the most common thing because most of us make boxes. But boxes can also be made at an angle for like serving trays. You can even have tapers in and out. So all those angles could vary. I'm doing it just a straight corner for demonstration. So these are a complete 90. So you want to verify that your angles are what you want them to be. And I'm doing tails first, which means I need to find, transfer this distance over to this board. So, simplest way to do that one that I know of is to take one of these marking gauges. Now, this gauge is somewhat of a knockoff of the type mark design uh, by Veritas. In that, you have a collet right here, and then you have a separate head unit right there. The head unit rotates around some threads. So you can move it back and forth, and then the collet tightens up on the bar itself. So, in order to adjust this, what I would do is I will lock the head down about halfway up through the threads. I will come over, place that on the ground, and drop that down. So now I have the perfect thickness right here. Then tighten up the collet so it locks it on the bar. At which point I will loosen up the head and I will rotate it about a quarter of the way backwards so that the head's going to move this way ever so slightly, about a quarter rotation, and that extends the bit ever so slightly. And that's what they were talking about by the micro adjuster. Now when you're using a gauge like this, you want to register the board against your body. You don't want to hold it out here. Because when you do that one, there's so many different ways you can move it. With it registered against your body, it is not going to be moving. And then you're only moving one portion. And this arm is pushing this way against the board. And you're just ever so lightly scratching the wood. You don't need to make a heavy dent. There you go. And because it's going to be the tail spur board, you want to mark it all the way around. And once again, just a light scratch not too heavy keeping it parallel lots of pressure on the side now I will say this this is one of the few hand woodworking tools out there that I think is far and away better than their antique counterparts Now their antique ones used to have those wooden blocks and I have one in a box somewhere but you would use the wooden blocks and then they would either have a blade or a pin on the side uh, you, you adjust them by tapping and it's kind of rough around it. These with these micro adjusters on the thread and being able to lock it, they just perform so much better than the old ones and they stay locked down. They don't waller out over time. Uh, I, the one downside is you are always using a cutting action whereas uh, the ones with pins, if you're going with the grain, they tend to follow the grain less. But the way they do these, the blade is at a slight angle this way. So as it's cutting, the blade itself wants to pull it in this way. So it's pulling it against the, the, the fence, which means it's less likely to follow the grain, but it is still a factor you have to watch out for. But far and away, I think these modern day marking gauges, much, much better than the old style. Now I went back and made these lines a lot heavier just because I didn't see it being shown up in the camera. Uh, that's way too heavy in my opinion, but I'm doing this for video, video purposes. So next you drop it into your vise and I like to do my layouts in the vise. It's just easier to do it when you don't have to worry about the work moving. Now, a lot of times you will have something like a groove running up the side right there that you'll have to take into consideration when you're doing your layouts, especially with dovetails. If I have a groove up here, I'm going to start the dovetail so that the groove is going to be in the waist side that pops out. So that way it will be hidden whenever the joints bump up against each other. But for this example, there is no groove. Let's just pretend this is a small cabinet. Now, there are several ways you can do layouts. One of the most common ways is I'm going to do two pins on my layout. A lot of people will just take a pair of dividers, space them out so that they can walk off two steps. So you will go one, two. And that gap that is left on the side, I'll do it from this direction. One, two. 
this gap right here is twice the error or twice that's going to be left. And I do want some left on the side. So I might extend it out a little bit and then walk it off again. One, two. If I like that gap as the end, I'll then walk it off a second time. One, two. And that will give me my two pins and the interior and the exterior gaps will be identical. That's just the nature of doing this walk-off method. It will look balanced that way. Other times, I don't want a very big gap on the end. I might say that I only want a quarter inch or so. So what I will do is I will come over here, I will mark a heavy line from both sides, and I will keep this gauge set the entire time. So once I've made that mark, these aren't going to change. That way it will be consistent all the way around. I can then come back and mark it off two steps from both directions. One, two, and I can get the center gap to as thickness as I want. Thick as I want, which I want it a little narrower than these over here. So I like this setup, I believe. There we go. I'm going to go a little bit wider. And then I'll make a heavier mark. So that gap is a little bit less than these two over here. I can now take my marking gauge, which has that 90 degrees. And I'm going to use that to mark all the way across with my knife. Come back over, make sure I'm right where I want to be. Came back over. One, two, three. Each one being markedly a little bit harder so it goes a little deeper. First one, you barely scratch it. Second one's a little deeper. Third one's deeper still. And for this one, I'm going to take those same dividers and I'm going to just as a surprise, mark off two more sections. And because my tails are now evenly spaced, they should look the same on both of them. And I'll need to make that 90 degree mark for those four dots. Next, it's a matter of transferring the lines down. And once again, I'm gonna use this little marking gauge. Uh, my gauge is set up to one and seven, but you can do anything you want as far as angles. The key thing is you want to be consistent. You don't want them to be variable. Otherwise, it'll look like a ruffian did them. Now, I don't worry about doing the other side because if I get this right, the other side will take care of itself. And I'm actually cutting into the show side so the inside is going to be glued to the other side of the board. So not that big a deal. So there we go. Nice, crisp, deep lines, all of them at the same angle. So after you've got the layout done, it's time to start sawing. And right before I do that one, I like to get it fairly perpendicular. It's a habit I got into from cutting uh, these no measure fast as I can go type of dovetails, which there was a video right before that one. And just a note that I've been filming this right after that video. So this might be the second dovetail I've cut in probably five months. Second joint hand tool joinery I've cut since then. And I'm saying that one because it's not really talent or repetition or anything like that that makes you a good dovetailer. Those really do help. But it's just following a certain number of sets. And once you've do developed a feel for cutting a straight line, being able to follow the line you marked, everything come, becomes a lot easier. All you got to do is have the ability to saw to the line. So when I'm going for accuracy, I'm pretty much always going to start on the far side. I'm going to work my way down this line right here. I'm not going to worry about coming down the face at all. Not until I get this just perfect. And so I'm going to use my finger and just by rolling it over, 
I can move the blade a little bit over. I'm keeping it straight up and down. I'm not worrying about the angle. And yes, I have darkened these with lead just because it wasn't showing up on the camera as well. It actually makes it a lot harder if you have this thick lead line to saw to. So I'm going to lighten my handle as best I can. I'll tell you how I do that in a second. I'm going to nibble, coming all the way across. And I can't really see my knife line. I'm just trying to go right in between that lead line. When I get that, I'm taking full strokes. Now I'm going to start focusing on coming down the line. I'm just keeping the saw moving and slowly bringing it down. Now the saw I'm using is a 22 tooth blade. Okay, if you see right there, there's a slight reflection off of the line, the edge. I'm slightly so off, so if I just twist my saw a little bit, I can get back on the line. I'm going to keep coming down, splitting the line as best I can. Now, at the end, I'm now connected to the board at this top corner and almost at the base of the line. I really can't go too much farther angle-wise because I'm starting to hit my mocks and vice. So now just not trying to go fast, I would just slowly ride it up. And now that I'm on the line, I just continue to go down. And there we go. You can still see a little bit of the lead and a little bit of the knife line at the very bottom. I stayed to this side of that knife line. Now I said I, this is a 20 tooth TPI saw tooth per inch and for this size work which is probably maybe around three eighths of an inch I actually do prefer it. The standard dovetails are going to be about 16 TPI and that is perfectly fine for any kind of dovetail you want but the feel wise and when I'm going for real accuracy I personally like the higher tooth count because more teeth are in the wood it gives it a smoother feel and I feel I have a little bit more control, but it is quite a bit smaller. But I need you also to take that with a grain of salt, because earlier I did tell you that I'm kind of used to that gent saw, and that gent saw is a 22 TPI. So it just might be closer to what I'm used to with that gent saw. I also mentioned that I was lightening the saw up. These back saws, when they designed them, the brass back that holds that plate solid, well, that's all the weight the saw needs to work. If you're pressing down on a saw, well, basically you're just filling up the gullets with sawdust and it stops working anyway, so more pressure doesn't do anything. That's all the weight it needs. But when you're working for accuracy, sometimes getting it started and getting to that line just started, it's nicer to have a lighter saw. And in that case, the design of the handle comes in. This is not an arbitrary design. Yes, you can only fit three fingers in there in the shape of it, and your handle goes on is perfectly sized so that your palm will fit in there and that's why they have custom shaped handles all the time and i go into all this kind of stuff in my classroom series when i'm talking about saws it's in chapter four if you want to check that video out but i can actually pivot the saw off of my palm a little bit by giving it a squeeze right here normally this thing is just dangling in my hand i have no pressure whatsoever but when i'm starting to cut out if I want to lighten it up, I'll just give a little squeeze right there. And it just seems to make it lighter and glide easier. And that's all I'm doing. Once I get it accurately set, I release my grip. And now I'm just pushing it back and forth. So I'll show you one more cut and then I'll just do the rest. I'm going to do this side so hopefully you can see what's happening with my wrist. I'm going to come over. I'm going to place my saw right on that edge. I'm going to lighten it up every little bit. I'm just going to get it moving. It's light enough that right now it is just gliding on top, not actually doing much work. And then I can bring it back slowly across the entire top. When I'm happy with that, my grip over here relaxes. And now I'm taking long strokes. I'm going to start lining up my angle. Just following that line down the face. And it does help to get some light so you can actually see. I was having a hard time seeing on this back side and I missed the line a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I bring it back up, start, get the saw going, and again. And now I just bring it down following that line. 
trying to stay on this side of the cut until I get all the way down. Not fast, but it is accurate. There we go. So I'm going to cut the rest and we'll come back. Now something I like to do when I'm doing really showy dovetails is this center waist right here. Normally I just come across with my coping saw and I am going to do that in a second just to get rid of the waist. But it's nice to break up the fibers a little bit on bottom. So if you just come down here and saw along, along your line, maybe get a little practice in and come way down close to that line just to break up those fibers. It will make chopping it out a lot easier when the time comes. Also, don't you think these are kind of wide tails? Maybe we should do something to dress those up. Now, one of the big advantages of a marking gauge that actually slices fibers is it does leave that little indentation. And if I'm going to cut across fibers, which I need to do to remove this end section, when I'm going for ultimate accuracy, it, it doesn't take that much extra time that once I have it in my, my vise to cut that section off, to just use a chisel to kind of create a V-notch down to the end of that cut. That will help the saw blade fall right next to that line and below. It will give me a nice crisp cut and if I'm off a little bit, that natural ramp will push it into this level. From there, it's just going to be sawing straight down that line to remove that one piece right there. And I am going to saw right next to that line. This is not going to be something where I want to pair back to it. Uh, Adding an extra step just means adding another chance to screw up. But before you take it out, be sure to get rid of any schmutz that you might have in that corner. Marking a knife is a good tool for that. I also suggest doing the same exact thing to your baseline before you saw it out. Because in case any fibers rip out as you're getting close to that line, having those fibers severed there will prevent them from breaking off into the pretty part of your wood. Now normally if I'm sawing out waste on this kind of thing, I'm using my uh, bow saw, which has really fine teeth. It allows me to turn the pretty tight corners and get a smooth finish. But the string broke on that one and I, didn't, I haven't done joinery in quite a while, so I, I need to rebuild that one. So I am going to turn back to my coping saw, which is done on the push cut instead of the pull cut normally. And I will angle it, the blade, ever so slightly to help me turn that corner a little bit easier and it is the push cut if there is any tear out it's going to be on this side instead of the show side so this is a two-handed tool come in slide down the curve twisting this way so that the teeth are hitting just the inside of the triangle not the face I want to keep come down close to the baseline get it moving turn that corner with it moving and take off the waste. From there it's just a matter of chopping out the waste as usual. Make sure you have a chisel that will work in the space. Only take about half the distance to the line and really ease into it. You do not want to blow this one out. I mean half the distance to the line until you can't take half the distance anymore and then go all the way to the base. It will not slip halfway because I have that little V cut down there. It just wants to go straight to that baseline. So make sure everything is perfect. Holding it perpendicular, perpendicular to you so that you can make, maintain that it is perfectly straight up and down. Maybe you might have to get a corner a little bit. Flip it and do the other side. Now, now I want you to notice there is a little bit of blowout right here. And what the reason why that happened was I went all the way to the line on the front side and went straight down, which left a little ledge on the back. 
that ledge, because there was nothing up underneath it, could crack off. And that's what broke it off. So many times it's advantageous to go halfway one side, go all the way to the line on the other side, and then come back and slowly back off to that line so that not as much wood is hanging off the edge so it won't break. I went on the face first so that I would know that this would be clean and if there was any blowout it would happen on the inside of the joint. No big deal. And last thing, sometimes it's nice to have a thin marking knife. I am a big adamant of having a thick bladed marking knife for the majority of your work but when things get really tight being able to sneak into a tight corner thin's the only way to go. The downside of thins is they are flexible so they I don't find them as accurate because they don't they move. Okay so there we go. Next is to transfer the lines and you want to make sure whichever face side you want to be the show side is facing you. So this has the clip crisp edge so I'm going to put this as my show side and I am using this Moxon vise and I like it because it has a nice flat right there. So my goal is to get this dead flat to that Moxon vise and sometimes that just means getting it really close, tightening up the vise and using a small rubber mallet to get it the last of the way. Just want to make sure I get it dead even perfect all the way across. If it's a little low on one side you can tap the bottom corner this way and it will right it up or bring it back down. However you want, that has to be perfect. I also have this little device right there that sits right in front and that's exactly level. So when I bring my board up, making sure the face side is going up, I can line it up. Now the hard things a lot of people had to do is lining up perfectly with the sides. It's another reason why I like my marking gauge because it protrudes out a little bit. So if I take the 90 degrees, drop it on there, it can register the side. So what I'll do is I will register it to the side and I will leave my marking gauge there so that it doesn't change and then just bring it on over. Now I do know a lot of people that on this interior right here before they start cutting anything they will put a shoulder there and that's where what you use that shoulder or router thing and just bring it down a little bit and that will give them a ledge to push against. Because I use this technique where it's nice and flush it doesn't really work for me. So my best, I don't have any problems of just doing it this way. Kind of eyeballing it so it's right on the edge. Making sure these two line up on both sides. And you're ready to rock and roll. Now if you were using a, a something like a groove all the way around. Putting a piece of wood inside the two grooves to align them. Would be a perfectly acceptable way of doing it. Instead of using this little dovetail gauge. And from there, it was just a matter of putting a lot of weight down so it doesn't move. I'm having to use a thin marking knife this time. And then just making my swipes to mark it. One, two, three. Each one getting a little bit firmer. One, two, three. And you want to make sure it stays flat with the side so that it's not off the edge any at all. But in a second, I will show you another trick in case... This isn't the most accurate way of doing it for you. Another thing you can do, and it works especially well if you have darker woods, is a little baby powder. Just drop it in there, spread it around, blow on it. And then anywhere the baby powder isn't, that's what you remove. And FYI, to transfer the bottom of my hound's tooth, I'm using the same marking gauge I used to mark out that. Just do it from the same face you're sawing into, so you know it will be the, exactly the same. Now, just like before, we want to transfer our lines down. Except this time, because the angle's on top, we're just going straight down. I got a little chip out there I'm going to have to deal with later on. But I just drop my knife into the knife line from my layout, come back over and mark straight down. Now some of y'all have caught on that I have not marked the base for the piece working into this one on this side yet. Uh, I do that one because I don't want a line going where I don't it's going to show on the show side. So I just kind of guesstimate my mark coming down 
and I don't really worry about it because this mark is going with the grain so it's a lot easier to hide whenever I'm finished with the whole thing. It does help if you have better good light, which I don't. Now to set up my depth gauge once again, real quickly, review, squash, tighten it up, lock it down, check to make sure it's okay, maybe make it a little bit wider, and there we go. From there, I will just pull this out of the clamp and mark just the parts that I know I'm going to be cutting off. That way I don't have any excess lines to remove. From there, it's just a repeat of all the sawing, chiseling, and waste removal steps. So get after it. Now one quick thing for those of y'all that want to try this hound's tooth pattern is I marked the baseline for the front section with this gouge right here. But you want to capture with your other gouge the distance from this side because it will help you clear it out and make it fit just perfectly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop it right into that, bring it up, secure it really tight this time, but I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to make it smaller or bigger. That's the exact setting I want. We can't do anything else. And in a second I'll show you how that works to help clean that up. Oh, and for those of you that are interested, I've just switched to a 16 TPEI tooth pattern. Both of these saws were pretty sharp, but I'm working on really hard escarpment cherry, and this is pecan, which is extremely hard. But you can see the speed difference, and just listening to the sound difference between the two. This one obviously cuts faster, but there's a lot more blowout on the back side, and the front side is a lot rougher. But it is perfectly adequate for cutting dovetails. It really could be just my preference for that 22 for this kind of stuff. Now I'm just going to chop these out, but you can t see that my hound's tooth, it's right there. So I want to keep this section right here and just get rid of those portions right there. So I had to be very careful of how I chop it. And I have already done my little V cuts, but once again, it is just a matter of going halfway to it and coming down. So I go halfway to the baseline, chop, chop, chop. Reverse it and do the same exact thing. Just being careful which section I chop off. So this is my last cut, so I went and just put a fresh hone on my blade and I'm going to start going in on the face side first to get rid of that last little bit. That way if there is any blowout, I'm sure that the face, the good looking side, will not crumble. If it is to crumble, I would rather it happen on the inside. So I'm going to come over, just drop it right in that knife line, give it one tap at an angle, or two taps. Then write it up and go straight down. Drop it in the knife line, give it one light tap at an angle, and then drop it straight down. Only going halfway. So I've gotten rid of the waist to the line from the front and the back. So now I just need to get rid of these hound's tooth sections, just this top portion. And this is kind of tricky, but it's not that hard. Basically, I just chop down a little bit and then pare it back. Chop down, pare it back until I get close to that knife line and then I will show you the trick I do with the marking gauge I laid out earlier. Okay, my last pairing one, I just wiggle it in. It's going to pop off just like that. Eyeball to make sure it's somewhat clear. And then you can use that wheel that we set earlier as a mini router plane just to smooth it out and get it just dead flat and perfect and parallel with the edge, just like we like. 
And this is the lazy man's way of doing it. You can also use your actual router plane to do the same exact thing. So there you go. You've done all your steps to the best of your ability. So now it's time to assemble it. Make sure you've got the face side up. All your joints are going in the right way. It should kind of snick in there. I like to use a metal mallet whenever I'm hammering dovetail together because it gives you a little different sound if it's too tight. This actually might be a tad bit too tight, so let's check it out. So you see it's fitting okay there, but right along here, it's a little tight from the sound of it. Now, it's critical if you had to take a dovetail apart that you don't just yank it off because you have leverage and this leverage is going to want to torque it one way or the other and you're going to crush fibers or even break stuff. So the best way to take something apart is I will come over and I will grab a rubber line mallet and then I'm going to lift it up ever so slightly, just enough, and then tap. That way, worst case scenario, it's only going to change a degree or two. Just lift it up, tap, until it comes apart. Then I can look and see what fibers are getting compressed. The cherry is a softer wood, so I'm seeing a little bit on the inside of getting a tad bit compressed. So in this case, what I would do is this being the inside of the joint, I would shave a little bit right here on each one of the joints just to give it a tad bit of clearance. So the idea is this is the face side, but on that first swipe, because I was looking at the camera, I actually did it on the wrong side. So we might have a little bit of a gap on this one right here. I'm going to go ahead and mark it with a pencil. But the idea is, see, this is the this is the inside of the joint right there. So you want to shave off right on these inside corners a tad bit, not the outside, because that's what's seeable. So I need to redo these real quickly. Just shave it off just the corner, not the face, like I did earlier, because I'm an idiot. So grab the mallet, the metal mallet, line everything up, make sure you're 90 degrees. It helps a lot if you're actually working on a box, because they will all secure themselves. Much nicer, much nicer. Just some light, even taps. And this one might be a bad bit too tight, I'm going to go for it. Pecan is that hard, and cherry can be that soft. There we go. Pretty tight. So there you go. A little bit of sanding and the sawdust will kind of fill in any microscopic gaps or bigger than microscopic gap, but there, there you go. You can still see a little bit of a gap right there. I'm not going to glue this together in this video, but normally what I would do is use hide glue because hide glue doesn't soak into the fibers. If you use normal PVA, it would soak in and swell the fibers and this would get way too tight. The hide glue, act, glue actually acts like a lubricant, plus the fact it mixes with the sawdust a little bit better because it's a little bit darker than PVA. So this would look really super tight with that setup. But to give you an idea of what it should look like after everything's said and done, if I just squirt it down with some DNA, it will exaggerate any errors, any gaps. So that's what the finished product should look like. And fixing that small gap is what my next video is going to be about. It's fixing the errors that creep up so that you can get cosmetically good joints. But that, that's really tight right off the thing, right off the saw. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. And if you did, please do me a big favor. Like, favorite, subscribe, do all those social medias. Tell your friends. Visit my website, wortheffort.com, where not only do I write a blog and I have a news email newsletter, but I also sell swag, such so like t-shirts, hats, and some of my own woodwork. And all of those really do go a long way towards helping me subsidize making this channel. Also, there are some shop-made tools there. 
And I want you to remember one last thing. That it is worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.